We start with lesson one, looking at society. And society exists for the good of all. Within society, we have businesses, and businesses fill the need. for society we go to the store and buy food we buy clothes because we don't have the resources and the time to create these things from raw materials so businesses are created to fill that need to give society those things that they desire within the business need the concept of business ethics assures a set of values in human conduct by which business is transacted. Well, sometimes the values in human conduct of a business organization are in difference with each other and that's where the laws and regulations come in businesses get from this their core values mission and vision statements but as we look at it from the legal standpoint we have the in the United States system we have the US Constitution as the foundation. I've written it at the bottom here because we're, we're showing that that's the foundation of our system. And then within that we have the federal system, the federal government, and the state government. State governments are not subservient to the federal system, but in some cases have more power and authority than the federal government does, and they work very closely together. These two agencies generally have three branches of government. They have a legislative branch. They have an executive branch. And they have a judicial branch. The ex executive branch, excuse me, the legislative branch, they enact the laws. Then it goes over to the executive branch to enforce those laws. Then, finally, it makes it to the judicial branch who is going to interpret the laws. Where the legal end of the business comes into play many times is when two parties are working together in a business transaction. We'll use, for an example, a contract. We have Acme Corporation contracting with Beta Corporation for uh, products or services and one party alleges that the other did not fulfill their end of it and they're aggrieved they want things done right so they go to court and they file a lawsuit a lawsuit begins with the filing of a complaint and this is done by the party we call them the plaintiff And let's say, for example, that here Acme Corporation is filing a complaint alleging that they had a contract with Beta Corporation and Beta Corporation breached the contract and they have $10,000 in damages. So now the plaintiff has filed the complaint. The defendant is served with a copy of this. And they normally have so many days to respond 
or answer the complaint. Normally what they're going to do is they're going to deny all the allegations in the complaint. And the reason for that is to preserve their rights for future discovery and trial. Uh, at this point, we have a disagreement between the parties. It's been brought into court. There are a couple of other op options that may be available we'll talk about later. Uh, alternate dispute resolution. And one is through just trying to settle the matter. Uh, Beta Corporation gets the paperwork, sees that they're being sued for $10,000. They say, you know what, it's going to cost us $5,000 to uh, take this case to court. It's going to take a lot of our time. Our people are going to be busy gathering evidence and doing all this stuff. We need to move forward. We're willing to settle this matter for $5,000. So they give an offer to the plaintiff. The plaintiff may or may not accept it, but all through this process, there's that option for negotiation. Alternate dispute resolution just basically says that we're going to take this matter outside the court system and do it in another venue called uh, ADR. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about ADR uh, later. It is something that's new and upcoming and especially in the uh, the civil area uh, for a variety of reasons. But let, let's continue with this. We have the complaint. The defendant has refiled an answer. And the next thing that we're going to go to is discovery. We want to know about the other party's uh, evidence. And so we're going to go through a discovery process. Trial can be very time-consuming and expensive and so let's get our evidence before we go to trial, and we do this through three ways. We do it through interrogatories. We're going to send to the other side questions. Please answer these questions and send them back to us. We do it through a request for production of evidence. So we may ask them for documents. If this is a breach of contract, we might say, okay, uh, we need to see a copy of the contract. We don't think the contract exists or whatever. And then the third one is depositions. Depositions are kind of like many trials because what they're going to do is they're going to call in parties to the suit and interview them in the presence of a court reporter, the court reporter will swear the witness. The witness will be questioned by the opposing counsel. Their counsel will be present with the opportunity to object to questions, uh, any disputes as to the objections would be handled by a judge at a later time. But that's kind of the, the, the discovery process in the trial. Once we get through the discovery process, if there's not a settlement cannot be reached, then we're going to go to trial. At the trial level, we begin with the seating of a jury. Most of the time, we're going to have a jury trial, and in civil matters, that jury may be made up of either six, somewhere between six to 12 uh, jurors and we go through a process called voir dire voir dire is latin it means to speak the truth and what we're trying to do is to determine if there's any biases that a potential juror may have that would affect the outcome at trial the objective is not to get a perfect jury but to get a fair and impartial jury and I'm looking for biases that a juror may have that would affect me for example if I've had a, a customer uh, if, if one of the potential jurors is a loyal customer to one of the parties they may the other party may say wait a minute you know they're they're in cahoots with each other I don't want them up there there's two parts of voir dire the first one is normally done by the judge and they're just looking for basic qualifications 
Are you 18 years of, of age? Are you uh, a citizen of the state and the district wherein this trial is occurring? Do you have a felony conviction or are you under uh, indictment for a felony at this time? Uh, once the initial qualifications are over, then the attorneys will get in and they will ask questions or they will give questions to the judge who will then ask those questions and they're going to ask questions regarding uh, their knowledge of the case and most of you have seen this on tv so uh, you kind of have an idea of how it works but when a jury or when a counsel uh, is questioning a juror there's two ways they can strike jurors there is a four calls let's say for example that uh, the president of acme corporation her mother is called as a potential juror well there's a four calls challenge uh, they're very narrow we don't want to sit around all day waiting trying to throw jurors off of a case or maybe sometimes weeks so they're the availability of four cause challenges are, are very limited. Then the attorneys are given what's called peremptory challenges. A peremptory challenge is limited in number, but you can knock a person off a jury for basically any reason. Usually it's, it's some kind of, they have displayed some kind of bias that you think would affect the outcome at trial and you've knocked them off when we get to the jury process we get the jury seated the next thing that occurs is we have opening statements normally the plaintiff begins with his opening statement followed by the defense in some cases, the defense may hold their opening statement until after the plaintiff has put on their case, but most of the time they do it right after that because the plaintiff's going to get up and say, this is what we're going to show you happened. The defense will get up and say, well, we're going to show you it didn't exactly happen that way. After that, we have the plaintiff's case in chief. And in their case in chief, they must put on case in chief they must put on all the evidence proving the allegations and that there were damages after the plaintiff puts on their case in chief the defense normally has a motion to dismiss normally you don't get this far in the trial process uh, if they haven't proven her case so generally this is just a uh, again to preserve for the record we've asked for it uh, the judge denies it and we move on to the next part which is the defense puts on their case in chief after the defense puts on their case in chief then the prosecution or excuse me the plaintiff can put on a rebuttal case because what happens is the plaintiff says this is what this is what happened and the defense says no that's not what happened they shoot holes in the def in the plaintiff's case so the now the plaintiff comes back and puts on their rebuttal case at this time after they put on their rebuttal and then there's another uh, defense to the re rebuttal we finally get down to the end of the cases where we have closing arguments The plaintiff says, folks, this is what we showed you. The defense says, well, that's not exactly what they showed you. And then 
there is jury instructions. The judge will read instructions to the jury. The judge will have some specific instructions. The attorneys will give to the judge instructions to be read to the jury. The jury will then deliberate and come back with a verdict, we hope. Uh, if they don't come back with a verdict, we have a hung jury. But they come back with the verdict. The verdict is by a preponderance of the evidence, which means more likely than not this event occurred. We have the verdict. In a civil trial, it does not have to be unanimous. If we have six jurors, then usually we need four out of the six to say, yes, that's more likely than not this occurred. If it was, say, 12 jurors, then it may be somewhere like uh, like somewhere between nine, nine out of the 12 to vote for that. They come back with the verdict. The judge passes judgment. And with the judgment, we have, at that point, either party can appeal up to the next highest level of court. Now let's talk a little bit about alternate dispute resolution. Many times in a contract, we will have a provision that says that if, if there's a disagreement as to the terms of this contract, all parties agree to submit this to alternate dis dispute resolution. And all this is is just kind of taking it out of the court's hands and putting it into a private um, matter. There's Usually it's faster than a trial. It's less expensive than a trial, but they generally follow kind of the same rules. Sometimes what they're doing here is trying to uh, act as a mediator. They're trying to mediate this matter. He said, she said type of thing. Well, you know, that's not really how it happened. You know, let's, let's get real here. And even a, a mini trial, uh, an advantage to the many, if they had to go to a, a trial, a, a private trial, so to speak, is publicity. Um, there are things that will be brought out in a public trial that I might not want divulged, so publicity might be an issue for taking it to alternate dispute resolution. Instead of going through the civil process, but the key thing usually it's faster, less expensive. Uh, one other thing is many times the mediators in these matters are experienced in the field. For example, you may have a case involving, let's say, the sale of a horse, and the uh, contract provision says if there's a dispute about the health of the horse that it will be sent to a panel of veterinarians. So there's some subject matter expertise that may be very helpful uh, in coming to the, the proper conclusion. 